Welcome everyone to the 2021 Future Spine Leaders Conference, uh, both in person and virtual. I'm happy to be here today and honored to give this talk on choosing the appropriate biologic, focusing on a patient-centered strategy for bone graft selection. My name is Rick Chua and I'm a private practice neurosurgeon in Tucson, Arizona, with an academic appointment in the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. And I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome you to not only the conference, congratulate you on your stage of your training and looking forward to your careers uh, in the near future. Please remember this initial uh, picture on my slide and we'll get back to it later about planting a new tree. And I'll use several analogies about our spinal fusion practices that I hope will be helpful to you as you engage your patients in spinal fusion surgery. Here are my disclaimers. Spinal fusions, as you know, in the United States are a very common operation and will soon become a very common operation in your practice, uh, not only in your residency and fellowship, but as you begin your careers. Spinal fusion is the one of the most common spinal procedures and occurs probably 700 to 750,000 times a year in the United States. The implant market, including pedicle screws, plates and screws is somewhere around $6 billion in 2016, but an untapped market or an unknown market is the value of bone graft products or biologics. And the forecast for the market in biologics in 2021 is $2.6 billion. So almost a third of the value of the implant market. And so it will be important for us to understand the concept of biologics and spinal fusion surgery. We all know, and you all are currently being trained on the most important parts of uh, spinal fusion surgery, which includes patient selection, the appropriate indications for spinal fusion, different surgical approaches and different surgical techniques. But a lot of our time is spent on instrumentation and fixation. Probably the least considered subject when we consider spinal fusion for our patients is the bone graft. And today's talk is really focused in on the conversation, education, and evaluation of bone graft for your spinal fusion patients. We'd like to take this opportunity to provide you with a strategy and a workflow for choosing your bone graft in attempts to achieving spinal fusion. And that is to first identify the patient need. The patient need then helps us understand the challenge of spinal fusion in that particular patient. The challenge of the patient but also the site and the procedure helps us determine the need for our bone graft. Whether a passive bone graft is sufficient or we may need an active bone graft or some combination of the above. And ultimately your selection of the bone graft comes from this strategy and thought process for your spinal fusion surgeries. As an example, your best chance at achieving a solid fusion is your first operation. And we all know, and you all know by now, that revising a failed fusion, especially someone else's, can be extremely challenging. And this is an example of a patient who had a four-level standalone cage and demineralized bone matrix fusion, who then failed, became infected, and subsequently went back for a three-level corpectomy with an expandable, page, expandable cage and an anterior plate. However, that operation also failed, and ultimately the patient came to me and had a revision decompression, completion corpectomy, inner body peak cage, along with the anterior plate and a posterior construct. So trying to avoid failed fusion, whether it's your own fusion or someone else fusion, is gonna be the key and will give you a strategy to help with that, especially with your bone graft selection. But when we consider surgeries, we also need to consider the demand of the operation the demand of the surgical site, and the demand of the biomechanics. So in a patient such as this with a grade two or grade three isthmic spondylolisthesis, the demand of a spinal fusion operation, including instrumentation, decompression, and bone graft are different than someone with a single level degenerative spondylolisthesis with spinal stenosis. And so arguably we need to understand the demands of the biomechanics and the patient as well as the operation to be able to choose the best bone graft and achieve this type of inner body fusion with pedicle screw instrumentation and ultimately a solid arthrodesis. 
So as you go through your training and we learn the importance of planning your operations, we spend most of our time thinking about the type of the procedure, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, pelvis, or deformity. We consider the approach, whether it's an anterior approach alone, a posterior approach alone, lateral approach, or some sort of combined approach. We spend a lot of time thinking about the technique, whether it's an open technique, an MIS technique, or even a combined technique. We spend quite a bit of time thinking about of our implants, not only the shape, but the size, the biomaterial, whether it's a fixed cage, an expandable cage, or a stackable cage. We spend quite a bit of time thinking about our screws, the diameter, the length, the material, but now we think more importantly about things like trajectory, angles, insertion, and exit sites. We think about the rods. When I trained, we just thought about the length of the rod. Now we think about not only the length, but the diameter, the biomaterial, the biomechanics, and the ability to achieve patient-specific rods. We think about a single rod all the way up to a quad rod or even a kickstand rod. As we've evolved our spinal surgical technologies, we think about image guidance. And hopefully now you've learned not only freehand pedicle screw instrumentation techniques, but you've learned fluoro-based and navigation or computer-assisted navigation for guidance and putting in your instrumentation. And now we're thinking a lot about robotics, the efficiencies and the execution of planning our surgeries with robotics and the potential use for artificial intelligence. But nowhere on this slide have we talked about or considered the importance of perhaps the most important part of the operation and that selection of the bone graft. This is a sample from the National Inpatient Sample Analysis, a huge study of over 125,000 patients to, radiate, to reiterate the concept that our outcomes are much better in primary surgery. Our outcomes and complications change when we go into revision surgery. And whether it's an unfavorable discharge, length of stays, neurological complications, DVT, pulmonary embolism, infection, or wound complications, we understand that these complications have a higher rate of uh, occurring with revision surgery. The concept is the more likely you have a revision surgery, the more likely you're going to have a complication. So what we do with our primary surgery first time makes a difference. Well, when we consider bone grafts for our fusion patients, we have to think about these different categories in order to make the best choice, just like we make the best choice for the approach, the technique, and the instrumentation. And that is the challenge of the patient, the challenge of the site of the surgery, the challenge of the procedure, and I would urge you young surgeons to start to think about the challenge of cost. Well, what about the challenge of the patient? We understand the commonly thought of issues of vitamin D deficiency, osteoporosis, multi-level fusion, NSAID use, age, and smokers. Those are all common concepts that we consider. We may not always consider the challenges of the site which might include blood supply, prior radiation therapy, prior infection, uh, diffuse or systemic bone quality, and whether or not the surgery uh, is primary or revision. We also need to consider the challenge of the procedure. Based on the approach, based on the technique, we may not have available autograft or significant volumes of autograft available. We need to consider the span of the instrumented fusion and the bone graft and we need to consider the availability of the bone graft. So these challenges are things that you should consider with every patient who you have considered a spinal fusion, even so much as spinal fusion surgery sometimes can be delayed in order to treat some of these patient or host factors and improve your surgical results. So in a 65 year old healthy active male, with degenerative spondylolisthesis at L4-5 and a large synovial cyst, there are very limited challenges for the patient, the site, the surgery, or the instrumentation. And this man is athletic and fit, not overweight, not a smoker, no diabetes, no bone density issues. With that, this is a limited challenge of uh, information and we can achieve a solid inner body fusion using an MIS technique in this particular case, 
T-lift for the inner body fusion, instrumentation with pedicle screws using robotic assisted navigation, and a solid posterior fusion, even with just inner body fusion technique alone. But remember, we need to also consider the challenges of the surgical site. Whether it's a single level fusion or more challenging multi-level fusions, we understand that fusion rates differ just with that factor alone, and those factors then make you consider your different bone graft options. We need to consider the blood supply to the surgical site. Prior surgery, prior radiation, steroid use, age, and smoking history can all affect blood supply to your surgical site. It can also affect the local bone quality. Whether it's a primary revision surgery, we need to consider those opportunities for improving our overall technique, and that includes our bone graft product. And more importantly, what we don't consider most of the time are the supporting structures. If a patient has had a revision surgery in the past and they've lost all of that surgical envelope and soft tissue envelope, we need to consider that the body's natural supporting structures may not be able to help us with our instrumented stabilization and therefore our arthrodesis. So I use this as an opportunity to convey the importance of MIS techniques in allowing us to achieve those natural structures to help with our instrumented fusions. But what about the procedure? The procedure and the approach itself may negatively affect our availability of autograft. If you're doing a lateral lumbar fusion or an anterior lumbar interbody fusion, or if you're doing minimally invasive techniques, while there may be some benefits of these techniques and approaches for your patient, it may decrease your availability of autograph, whether it's local at the site of the fusion or remote, for instance, at the iliac crest. We also need to consider the biomechanics of the procedure you're performing, whether it's an inner body fusion alone, whether it's posterolateral lateral fusion or a combination, in addition to the type of instrumentation stabilization whether they're pedicle screws, cortical screws, uh, or other types of fixation, we need to consider these as challenges of the procedure, but to improve the results, we want to address the challenges, not only with indications, approach, technique, and instrumentation, but consideration of the bone graft. So a patient like this who has had multiple transforaminal endoscopic procedures at L3-4, presented to me with a recurrent radiculopathy and severe mechanical low back pain. She's an elderly woman with osteoporosis, bone density issues local and regionally, continues to be a smoker, and has this problem suboptimally treated with conservative treatments. So rather than a large multi-level thoracal lumbar deformity surgery, she was offered a minimally invasive lateral inner body fusion surgery at L3-4 to improve the disc space height and foraminal height on the left side and achieve a solid inner body arthrodesis with additional pedicle screw fixation. While this patient may on the face of it seem like a highly challenging case for a successful fusion, I've created the opportunity to make this a limited challenging case with a lateral approach minimally invasive, large inner body spacer and cage, appropriate bone graft for rapid anterior inner body fusion with supplemental fixation. But then there are the significant challenges such as this patient who has had multiple thoracal lumbar deformity operations resulting in a T4 to pelvis fusion. After multiple operations, however, she failed and developed mechanical low back pain based on a pseudoarthrosis at T910 and T1011. You can see fracture through the bone mass, broken rods, and mechanical low back pain due to the pseudoarthrosis. An extremely challenging environment, but trying to take the whole patient as a whole, individualize the problem, which is the pseudoarthrosis and failed instrumentation at two levels, and not be distracted by all of the other instrumentation, and narrow this down to a more limited challenging operation, which is a lateral inner body fusion for pseudoarthrosis augmented with active grafting to achieve a fusion and reducing the chances of having to go back and redoing all of the posterior operation. And here's her post-operative x-rays showing an inner body 
solution, and she went on to a solid inner body fusion. Well, why is choosing a bone graft so important? And we've already hinted at this. We know that the phrase that we use, at least I use with my patients and colleagues, is that lumbar spinal fusion and success of that is a race. It's a race between getting the segments fused and failure of the instrumentation. The other colloquialism that we use is it's a race from immediate fixation to bony fusion or arthrodesis. But I challenge you that our current training and our current practice, we spend the least amount of cons time considering our choices of bone graft, and we spend a lot more time thinking about the implants. Failure of a fusion or pseudoarthrosis almost always means another surgery. And we all know what revision surgery means. If a fusion is going to fail and does fail, ultimately so will the fixation and instrumentation. So consideration of fixation and instrumentation is as important as bone graft selection and arthrodesis. Well, what about the role of fixation and instrumentation versus the role of fusion? We understand, although I think we sometimes forget, that our instrumentation and fixation provides us with temporary stabilization of a motion segment. Ultimately, our bone graft provides the substrate, either passive or active, for an ultimate biological fusion. So remember, fixation is temporary, fusion is permanent. I have this conversation with my patients, and they get it when we talk about the combination of fixation and fusion. And going back to my picture of the tree, I like to use this analogy for my patients, and I am hopeful that it will help you understand the importance of instrumentation and fusion with the analogy of the tree. When we plant a new tree, i.e. we're going to achieve a fusion, we need to dig a hole. We need to prepare the area for the fusion. We need to prepare for the area where the roots of that root ball from the tree that are planted are going to grow into the ground to achieve a solid tree or a solid fusion. We need to fill the hole with dirt and fertilizer. The analogy is we need to prepare the area of the fusion, whether it's the disc space and inner body space, whether it's the posterior lateral gutters or the anterior inner body space or the lateral masses. It's important to do proper gardening and proper carpentry. And then of course, we're gonna stabilize the new tree with stakes and rope or stakes and wire to prevent that tree from swaying in the wind and the more the tree sways in the winds, the less likely the roots are gonna be able to grow out from the root ball into the dirt to have a nice solid foundation for a tree. And then of course, with a new tree or plants, we water, we fertilize, and we pray. And I think there are a lot of analogies you can take from this in your own concept of spinal fusion surgery and how we educate our patients. Well, let's talk a little bit about the biology of fusion. So we understand that there are three processes that occur and all three processes are needed for a successful fusion. The osteoconductive nature of a bone or bone graft serves as a scaffolding. It serves as a scaffolding for bony ingrowth and for neovascularization. But osteoconductivity means providing a scaffolding. Osteoinductivity is the idea that we recruit a cellular response from the host or the patient cells will differentiate into osteogenic cells. And the final and most important category is osteogenesis. Remember that those recruitment of osteogenic cells or osteoblasts will then actually create and synthesize the new bone, whether it's from the host collagen matrix with calcium or an artificial or allograft collagen matrix and calcium, but it requires all three processes biologically to achieve a successful fusion. Well, what are our bone graft options? And you know these and could recite these. Uh, the most important in the gold standard is autologous iliac crest, but we can also get autograph from local bone from our laminectomy or facetectomy or from a remote site. We also have options of allograft, demineralized bone matrix, bone morphogenic protein, and a whole host of newer products that I broadly categorize as ceramics, synthetic peptides, and cellular autogra autographs, allographs. Iliac crest has all three properties of osteogenesis, osteoconductivity, and osteoinductivity, and it remains the gold standard. 
But I challenge that even many of you probably have moved away in your training from obtaining autologous iliac crest. A lot of reasons why. It takes time to harvest the graft. The patient may have limited supply if they've had revision surgery and multiple prior operations. Donor site morbidity is anywhere between five to 20% and includes hematoma, infection, chronic pain, and even pelvic fracture. And for a guy like me, my limited experience in iliac crest bone graft stems from my career of transitioning to other bone grafts. Hopefully you will have that tool in your toolbox to be able safely and effectively understand and perform the technique of iliac crest bone graft harvest. Now that we've spent some time strategizing over the bone graft, we do need to not only consider what type of bone graft we're using, but what's actually in the package because there is variability in all of these products. And we'll talk about these briefly with this strategic graft or visual. We can consider the synthetic grafts that are passive grafts, which offer some osteoconductivity and a structure or a scaffolding. But our synthetic grafts oftentimes are visible on X-ray, but more difficult to view the fusion later on as the fusion process occurs. It, they provide us with significant topographical advantages that may not be offered by other bone graft or bone graft categories. One of the more common bone graft categories are the demineralized bone matrices. And these products have a wide variety of activity and a very wide range of osteoconductivity. They differ in many circumstances, including the processing method, which can change the activity or the osteoconductivity. They also have a variety of different carriers which can, which can change the handling techniques, but also the effectiveness. And there are different methods of achieving sterility in the bone graft products. And those can ultimately change both positively and negatively the rate or range of osteoconductivity. So be prepared to look at those for each individual bone graft product or category, including the cell-based matrix matrices often based on the activity of demineralized bone matrix, but a variety of ranges of cell health and viability, variety of cell counts. The uh, logical uh, analogy is bone marrow aspirate, which has the highest degree of cells for osteogenesis. But remember that these cell-based matrices lack substantial FDA regulatory review for safety, efficacy, cell count, and health and viability. So again, a list includes demineralized bone matrix, cortical bone allograft, cancellous bone allograft, a matrix incorporating all of those. You also need to consider the carrier, the scaffolding, and the whole idea of ceramics. Bone graft extenders becomes a very, very vague terminology when we talk about bone grafts. And bone grafts extenders are meant to be used in combination with autograft. The bone graft extender and the autograft combination works well and effectively as if it was autograft alone. However, remember that the demineralized bone matrix has very little inductivity and no osteogenesis. That's going to be achieved by your autograft. And we can go all the way to the far right of bone graft extenders and scaffolding to bone graft replacement. So the idea is RHBMP2 or infuse is equivalent performance and effectiveness as autograft when used alone and does not require any local autograft, demineralized bone matrix, or additional carriers. As a synopsis of choosing your bone graft based on activity, conductivity, inductivity, and osteogenesis, think about this transition of bone graft extenders on the left, including synthetics and allograft, which provide a passive bone graft with scaffold only, transitioning into graft activity and activity of osteoinductivity and osteogenesis, including the cell-based matrices and autograft extenders, other demineralized bone matrix autograft extenders with a carrier, all the way to the final category on the right, the very highly active bone grafts with the most degree of osteogenesis, osteoinductivity and osteoconductivity infuse BMP2. The concept here are there are a lot of products and the topic of this 
is not to consider the individual products, but know that you have a wide selection of products in the blue of highly osteoinductive products for your bone graft substrates or your bone grafts for whatever fusion. Anywhere from the MagnaFuse bone graft through the Grafton series of products to Progenics and Infuse, we have a variety of bone graft extenders with passive activity all the way up to active products, all the way up to the highly active bone graft replacements. Please understand that when you choose your bone, craft, bone grafts, please read the label. Please read the scientific studies that show how the process of bone graft and demilized bone matrix was created. What's the formulation? What was the process to prepare it? What were the options and methods to achieve sterility? All of these concepts can affect the osteogenesis and osteoinductivity of your product, which is important for achieving a solid successful fusion. And another graphic way of uh, putting this all together, when we have patients with low challenges for the patient, the surgical site, the approach and the instrumentation, all the way up to the highly challenging patients on the right, we wanna be able to fill the gap with your bone graft products. We wanna take passive grafts and make them more active. We wanna make active grafts more highly active to ultimately achieve the same fusion in all of those patients. But how do we determine fusion? And we could spend hours talking about that perhaps over the break on how we determine fusion in our spinal fusion patients. I was trained with the idea that if a patient did not have any movement on flexion and extension or less than three millimeters of movement, then the patient was likely stable and fused. Now with our advanced imaging techniques, with our advanced technologies for inner body fusion, we also consider other radiographic factors such as bridging bone in the inner space, bridging bone across the facet joints or the lamina, or even the inner spinous process space. The other criteria for solid instrument effusion is lack of hardware loosening. And we all understand that if we see loosening hardware, we need to consider pseudoarthrosis. So I challenge you to find the best method for you to uh, um, provide evidence of fusion. Standing dynamic weight bearing x-rays, CT scan to show bridging bone. Clinical symptoms, including mechanical back pain, can give an indication of successful or lack of successful fusion. But remember that our bone graft products have variable appearance on imaging modalities and their appearances change as the fusion matures. Debrinalized bone matrix at the front end doesn't look like bone, neither does infuse, but some of the other products may look like bone when you first put it in, but we know that they're not fused, and so that appearance may change over time. And there is another concept that I challenge you to consider in your early career, and that is the presence of air in the disc space or the facets, either prior to fusion or after fusion, what does that imply about the integrity of the motion segment? So is this patient who's had a multi-level fusion and appears to have solid bridging bone across the disc space, but has some air in the L5-S1 disc space and some loosening, lucency around the screws, does that mean the patient is not fused, whether or not they're symptomatic or not? Coincidentally, this patient is three years out from his L4 to S1 fusion and has no pain and has a full and healthy lifestyle but he still has some lucency around his screws, which remain stable, I would argue that this is a successful arthrodesis and fusion. My personal observations over over 20 years of spinal fusion include the following, and I hope you'll take these home with you uh, after this course. And that is preparation of the fusion bed is probably more important than your selection of bone graft, your selection of instrumentation, or your surgical technique but please consider proper selection of your bone graft. Not just all of the issues we've talked about prior, but consider the volume of bone graft, for instance, in the inner body space, especially if you're not going to augment it with posterior lateral bone. Consider how to retain your bone graft in the space and use that as part of your technique improvement. And remember to educate your patient about the other concepts to achieve a successful fusion, which includes avoiding NSAIDs, immobilizing and restricting their activities, and educate your patients about early wound issues. 
There's nothing I hate worse than an early wound issue that we did not manage aggressively enough. And the early wound issue turns into a late wound issue, turns into infection, turns into a pseudoarthrosis. And we'd like to minimize those stories as much as possible. Remember that the patient factors are important in deciding your fusion just as much as your approach, your technique, your fixation and instrumentation. Don't forget to individualize the biomechanics of your patient so you understand the best bone graft. Please take the time to understand the preparation for your bone graft site, how your bone graft is applied, how it handles for your use and the radiographic visualization, and do think about the cost. I remember about 15 years ago where a hospital approached me about reducing my implant costs. And so you may need to participate in choices you make to reduce the cost of care, whether it's your instrumentation or your implants. And finally, remember the consideration, the cost factor. Autograft is always your best friend. So in this patient who had OPLL and cervical myelopathy, she underwent a multi-level cervical corpectomy with peak inner body space or an anterior plate, but autograft bone alone from her vertebrectomy site, she's gone on to a solid fusion and is now five years out and happy as a lamb. Remember availability of bone graft and the cost. This is a patient for which I operated on in Nepal as part of a humanitarian mission in POTS disease with significant kyphosis who had become wheelchair bound. And we were able to do a very sophisticated for that part of the world, multi-level instrumented fusion and reduction for kyphosis, but had very little bone graft available but we were able to achieve a very satisfied patient, not even six weeks after the surgery, ambulating with her husband in the clinic in Nepal. <laughs> and the smile on her face tells the whole story. So remember a fairly simple frame, framework for a patient-focused graft selection. We want to achieve fusion and avoid pseudoarthrosis. Consider the challenges of the patient, the site, the procedure. Select your bone graft based on this strategy and bone formation. Support your strategy with your graft choice. And remember the range of passive all the way up to highly active graft strategies. Your first chance to fuse is your best chance to fuse. And if you do this strategy and think about it in a scientific basis, you will be able to overcome the challenges of achieving a fusion. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you learned something about a patient-centered strategy for choosing your bone graft. Please enjoy the rest of your conference, and I look forward to your young and exciting and productive careers in spinal surgery.